I'll be starting off our presentation on multi-microbiome effects, probiotic strategies to target next generation microbes. So what are next generation microbes? So in the literature, we've seen that Acromantia mucinophila and Fecalibacterium pretzinitiae have been identified as next generation microbes. Acromantia mucinophila has been described as immune modulating, metabolism modulating, an acetate producer, and as its name states, it consumes mucus. This oval-shaped bacterium and the rod-shaped Fecalibacterium pretzinitiae both reside in the mucus. Fecalibacterium pretzinitiae is also immune modulating. It's a major producer of butyrate, one of the famous short chain fatty acids in the gut, and it secre secretes multiple anti-inflammatory compounds. Both of these species have also been identified as biomarkers of health. In the feces of stool from individuals with healthy people, there are higher levels of these species. However, in diseased individuals, as those listed here, there are low le lower levels. So specifically, Acromancy mucinophila has been found at lower levels in the feces of people with type 2 diabetes, obesity, cardiometabolic disorders, hypertension, and liver diseases, while low levels of Fecalibacterium pretzinitiae have been identified in the feces of individuals with IBD, IBS, celiac disease, and colorectal cancer. And because of these health associations, there, has, there have been efforts to attempt to deliver these species orally. And there does seem to be some promise in this area. There have been isolations of different strains of Fecalibacterium pretzinitiae and characterization of those strains, identifying anti-inflammatory capabilities. There is some low oxygen tolerance of Acromancy mucinophila. Both of these are anaerobes, which can make them difficult to culture and grow. There was even a clinical study last year in people with metabolic syndrome. Um, Acromancy mucinophila, although no strain was identified, was delivered to these individuals. It was found to be safe and well tolerated. And there were some benefits observed for insulin control. Even some increase in the bacteria was observed in the feces. However, at the same time, there are many challenges. So as we've seen in meta-analyses of probiotic clinical studies, probiotics are known for strain-specific efficacy. So much more research needs to be done on specific strains of these species and what the different functions are. There is particularly extreme oxygen sensitivity for the growth of Fecalibacterium pretzinitiae, which can be difficult for manufacturing. And as we've seen in the literature of probiotic clinical studies, there is a dependency on the amount or the dose, depending on which type of probiotic it is and the disease application. So it's unknown what would be the effective dose or more effective dose of some of these particular uh, bacterial strains and if they would be determined to be probiotics. So first, safety and tolerance, of course, would still need to be identified, even though there's a lot, there's a lot of research in this area. Uh, safety and tolerance would be identified first. And as we know, the definition of a probiotic is that live microorganisms, when consumed or delivered at adequate amounts, confer a health benefit on the host. So there are multiple factors that need to be met before a strain of one of these species could be identified as a probiotic. However, there are alternative ways than just looking at probiotics to um, increase these keystone species. There was a systematic review on dietary factors, and there's a nice table in this reference that shows many different attempts. There was some success found with various lengths, such as four weeks or more, with certain bioactives that showed some increases in acromancy mucinophila. However, there's a great deal of heterogeneity of these studies and increasing acromancy mucinophila may depend on personal characteristics such as ethnicity, such as the baseline endogenous microbes, whether the person has various conditions or diseases and is taking different kinds of medications. There are also many studies that have been done on certain prebiotics like the famous prebiotic inulin or oligofructose, various starches, 
And some of these doses were five grams, seven grams, 16 grams, and even 52 grams, which is quite large and might be inconvenient. Some of those studies showed increases in Vicalibacterium prasnitzii. There was a study that showed an increase in both of these species. And this study was done in type two di diabetic patients. However, it was done uh, with these patients also on metformin. Now metformin and bariatric surgery, by the way, have been shown to increase acromancy mucinophila. So that's sort of a confounding factor there. However, this, this study, as I mentioned, in type two diabetic patients on metformin, had multifactorial approaches. There was a reduced energy diet, specifically a deficit of 500 calor kilocalories per day and multiple prebiotics. So nopal, which is a cactus prebiotic, 14 grams of that, four grams of chia seeds, 30 grams of soy protein and four grams of enulin was all taken together. And as you can see on the right, there are multiple sources of enulin or fructooligosaccharide containing foods for your interest. Uh, there weren't any probiotics as by themselves that were evaluated in clinical studies in this systematic review. There was another study I'd like to mention separately, a pilot study showing that there was an increase in both of these species as well. And you don't have to actually take any food according to, to those results. Fasting was effective apparently. I will mention also some interesting in vitro studies. So the very common food that we may always eat, apples, has a fiber called apple pectin, and it was shown in vitro to encourage the growth of multiple strains of Fecalibacterium prepsnitzii. However, uh, the type of apple might affect the growth. So now we'll move on to different approaches. Specifically, are there any probiotics that increase acromancy mucinophila and or Fecalibacterium prepsnitzii in the gut? The answer is yes and we will discuss two of those for you. The first is a single strain called B420 for short, or Bifidobacterium animalis subspecies lactis 420. It has been shown to be effective for weight management. This graphic demonstrates effects that have been observed in in vitro and in vivo, and a six month clinical study um, and or rather. So some of the studies have shown different aspects here. So enhanced tight junction integrity, increases in short chain fatty acid production, which may increase the production of satiety hormones and thus reduce food intake and help with the regulation of body weight. So I'll go over just a couple of results from that study. There was a six month clinical study in overweight individuals and they were taking B420 at 10 billion CFU per day over the six months, there was a reduction in body fat mass as compared to the placebo group at the end of six months. And not only body fat, but also body weight was controlled. So in the next slide, you'll see the graphic on uh, body weight regulation. I don't have it listed here, but there was also a reduction in waist circumference observed for the B420 group. And on the topic of the microbiome, uh, there were many different bacteria observed. I'm only going to select out the percentage of Acromancia abundance. This graph shows the percentage of Acromancia that was observed in the placebo group versus the B420 group. And at six months, there was an 88% difference in abundance of B420 groups percentage of Acromancia relative to the percentage of Acromancia in the placebo group. The percent change from baseline to six months that the probiotic group experienced was a 73% increase in their percent of acromancy abundance. So now we'll move on to the next probiotic combination. Actually, it was an eight strain combination. This is a new probiotic supplement that is all delivered in one capsule. So this Combination was designed based on the availability of the strains, the safety, the efficacy. So you see these are all clinically effective doses that were targeted for this formula to be combined into one capsule. And the doses that correspond to clinical studies for this capsule are listed here. However, I will mention at least one highly uh, popular study 
of some of the combinations of these strains. So there are many other studies not listed here that showed gastrointestinal and immune effects. For example, BIO7 and CFM and BLO4 and LPC37 as a four strain combination was recognized in the World Gastroenterology Organization guidelines for being effective against antibiotic associated diarrhea, reducing the number of diarrhea days by over 50% and reducing associated symptoms such as bloating, abdominal pain, and fever. And you, as you see in the studies listed here, in CFM and BIO7 at this particular dose, reduced the number of pain days taken post colonoscopy screening. LPC37 at 10 billion CFU per day was studied in a stress response study that has been completed and we're eagerly awaiting the publication. 20 billion CFU of LP115 or 20 billion uh, CFU of BLO4, both showed immune modulatory effects on vaccination response in an eight arm RCT. HN01 and HN019, both at five billion CFU per day, but separately tested in elderly patients for a three week study on their immune function showed increases in natural killer cell activity and cellular phagocytosis. And as you know, natural killer cells are so important for controlling infections of viruses, as well as tumor cell growth. And so that's a very interesting finding as well. Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG is one of those widespread popular bacterial strains out there. And it has mostly been studied in children for acute gastroenteritis, but has also shown some promise in milk allergy tolerance for children. And in this particular dose of 20 billion CFU per day, it was shown to increase allergen specific IgA salivary levels in young adults with seasonal allergies, suggesting that it may help with allergen tolerance as well. So this combination in this one capsule of all eight strains of these doses was tested in a clinical study I presented last year in October. And now Dr. Ryan is going to be sharing with you some very interesting microbiota results. Thank you, Dr. Patno. Uh, and I just want to reiterate, uh, yeah, so the, the conferences that Dr. Patno had presented at previously in the fall uh, present focused on the safety tolerability data that we had collected. And so the, what we're going to focus on today is uh, microbiota data. So this is a very brief overview of the study design. This was a single arm open label study that included 10 healthy adults. And they were asked to take this probiotic formula one capsule per day over, the over a 10 day period. We collected stool before and after they had taken the probiotic and we analyzed it using 16S ribosomal RNA PCR. These are our uh, most interesting uh, findings with the stool analysis, we saw a statistically significant increase in lactobacillus uh, and a near significant increase in bifidobacteria. Now that's not surprising given that we had provided the study participants with a probiotic formula that contained five strains of lactobacillus, three strains of bifidobacterium. But what was interesting and unexpected were these statistically significant increases, as you can see in the bottom of the slide, uh, the lower right, F. prosnitzii and A. mucinophila. And this figure depicts uh, a, a hypothetical uh, model for how that could explain these results. On the left, you can see that Again, we gave lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. We know that these microbes produce acetate as a metabolic byproduct, acetate being one of the main, sh the main short chain fatty acids. F. prosnitzii, I mean butyrate and producer in the gut uses acetate as a butyrate precursor. Butyrate is rapidly taken up by the intestinal epithelial cells, including the goblet cells. And part of what butyrate does is regulate mucin expression, mucin production. Um, mucin is one of the main components in mucus and acromancia mucinophila, mucinophila being a mucinophile consumes mucin as a main source of fuel and then also produces acetate further adding to this potential pool of acetate that F. prosnitzii can take up and then use uh, it as a precursor for butyrate. 
We also know that uh, bifidobacter certain strains of bifidobacterium have been shown in co-culture experiments to have a cross-feeding relationship with F. prosnitzii. Also, uh, F. prosnitzii and A. mucinophila are believed to share a metabolic network in the gut. These are references for that last slide. Now, in summary, uh, F. prosnitzii and A. mucinophila, again, previously described as next-gen microbes. They are associated with many inflammatory and metabolic diseases. We know that there is potential for cross-feeding relationships between uh, these microbes and other species. Uh, F researchers are exploring the use of dietary strategies to increase uh, F. prosnitzii uh, and A. mucinophila. Uh, two probiotics have been shown to impact uh, these microbes. The B420 research that showed over a six month period that uh, A. mucinophila increased with six, six months of, increase of intake of B420. And then this small recent study that demonstrated that uh, a, an intake, oral intake of an eight strain combination was associated with a, a pre post increase in F. prosnitzii and A. mucinophila. Again, that was just over 10 days. Now, we acknowledge that the study had some limitations uh, and additional research is necessary to follow up, and follow up on and confirm those findings. So thank you for your attention and we will take questions at this point if there are any. I'm checking to see if I saw any questions in the room here. I didn't, I didn't see any questions. I actually have one. Um, there's, there seems like there'd be a lot of linkage here between like mast cell stability, like histamine responses and mast cells. Is there any, any of your research that is tied directly to those particular, and that's a, a gajillion pathways, right? But is, is, is there, uh, do you have any comments or research that we might check out with respect to that. One of the things that we run into a lot is chronic mast cell activation mm -hmm. and looking at some of the lower level processes that you, you just shared, it seems like there would probably be a tie. I was, I was just curious, uh, but it might not be a, a fair question at this. Yeah, with, with this formula, that's not something that we've explored, but uh, Dr. Patno is very familiar with the those strains. Do you have any comments? There have been in vitro studies on several of these strains. Nothing comes to the top of my head at the moment regarding histamine or, uh, or effects with mast cells. I know that they've looked at different metabolite productions you know, there are other concerns of safety that are screened and these are all recognized as generally recognized as safe. So I think there needs to be more research now that that is a more popular topic in, in the circles around probiotics and how they might affect that particular condition. Yeah, it'd be very interesting to see. This is excellent. Thank, thank you so much, both of you.